Hello, welcome to another episode of the Farfetch Podcast. Today we're kind of throwing it back a little to the uh, beginnings of the podcast because we are doing an audio only episode. Unfortunately, I couldn't record today because I was having some issues with the camera, but uh, we are all going to be okay and we'll get back to um, filming next week. But anyway, um, today I have another awesome story for you. This one is basically um, about weather gods. Now, I got inspired, uh, and I will share the inspiration of this story um, later, but it's about basically these, it's about weather gods who control different kinds of natural disasters and this sorts of thing. And then it's about also a response team who goes in and responds to these natural disasters. And they're really the only people on earth who know about the weather gods to begin with. And so um, it's kind of an interesting dynamic there. The weather gods are mean, uh, but some of them are kind of civil um, and they control hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, uh, floods, earthquakes. And so this story has a lot to offer. I really enjoyed writing it. It's unlike a lot of the stories I've written for the Farfetch podcast because I feel like it has more layers. Um, there's, you know, one, you know, there's the team and then there's also the gods themselves. So without further ado, I'm just going to start reading it. It's quite long. I think it's about over 5,000 words. So this is one of the longer ones. So sit in and uh, enjoy the ride. It took me three whole days of high-speed boating to get to the Nazca Plate. At the time, I was using my favorite boat I called the Juggernaut. No matter how tough the waves were, it always kept its balance and pushed me through anything that was in my way. Luckily, the boat had both manual and automatic controls. I was able to get a couple of hours of sleep throughout the day, usually when things calmed down, but still, being in the ocean all alone was never easy. I had a collection of music saved up to my phone, but even that got old after a while. I'd run through all the songs I've saved and cursed myself for forgetting to download a classic before, from my youth before I left. I'm at the right side of the plate. I radioed to the only to the other members of the um, the team. I'm about to go down. I made it to the bottom side. Briggs phoned. He had to travel almost double the miles I had and left headquarters about two days before I did. He was the most experienced natural disaster responder on the team and had been something of a mentor to me when I started. He wasn't a fan of some of the other members of this responder's team, but they weren't big fans of him either. Logan voiced in, Man, you guys have really got fast boats. I'm still chopping through the waves. I gotta tell you, Howard, I'm in dire need of an upgrade. Then, minutes later, Lindsay confirmed that she was at the side of the plate. She had her talkie muted and revealed to us that she hadn't been listening to our direction almost the entire time. Briggs scolded her for this because it wasn't the first time she did it. He truly believed that she turned off a radio intentionally so she didn't have to hear the other members talk, but I knew that Lindsay was just forgetful and clumsy. She was kept on the team largely due to her technical skills with responding and stopping tornadoes. And after Logan announced that he made it to to his side to the Nazca plate, we started gearing up for our dives. I strapped on my oxygen tank er around my back and then placed the breathing device around my mouth. I put flippers and gloves on as I'd already been outfitted with a wetsuit before I left on the boat. But the most important thing I grabbed was the waterproof drill that I kept inside the boat. I took it out of its case and threw it on my shoulder. When we were given to the, the go-ahead to dive in the water, the drill practically lowered me down to the tectonic plates below. The hardest part of the job was about to begin. I was really good with stopping hurricanes and guiding tornadoes away from populated areas, but I was not good at stopping earthquakes. When Howard told the team that the Nazca plate would crash into the it would would crash into uh, the Cocos plate later that week, I prayed I, he wouldn't ask me to go on the mission to stop it. I hated stopping earthquakes because I was claustrophobic. Whenever the plates were about to brush against each other, I would always choke up. It was strange because I could deal with some of the worst natural disasters the world could produce. Wildfires were among my specialities. For example, I had no problem responding to a problem like that. 
Either way, it took about 20 minutes to reach the tectonic plate underneath Earth. From time to time, there were ocean predators that would attempt to stop me from getting there. For example, the last time I responded to an earthquake, there was a shark that tried to kill me, but I activated my drill and waved it around my body to get the shark to leave, and it worked. Briggs himself had a shark bite in his boat when he was heading towards the Australian plate several years ago. Luckily to this day, Briggs still brought a trusty harpoon, which he used to impale the great white. Then he was able to continue on his way without interruption, but Howard told me that everyone will still have a near-death experience during one of their times responding to an earthquake. In some ways, it's the most dangerous thing we have to do. I got down to the crust and could already see where it was about to smack into the other crust. I turned on my spinning drill and it started chipping away at the rock, but I knew, even from the beginning, that it would take a long time to break it all down. I spent the first 20 minutes of my time underwater breaking down the rock that would first make contact. Then I made my way down the rest of the rock and continued until I was finished. From time to time, I would hear the plates shake just a little bit. This was probably because either Logan or Lindsay allowed one part of the plate to rub up against another. The only reason they were on the natural disaster response team was because they used to be extreme storm enders. If there was a tornado, they would take one of their extreme vacuums, go under it, and suck it up. But as I mentioned, earthquakes were, were not their speciality. However, it took us about three hours to clear the nun's cup plate from dangerous contact with the other plates. Many years ago, the team had placed sensors along the plates in the wor of the world so we could be alerted to when they were getting close. Once Howard, the leader of the response team, gave us the clear, we were able to head back to the headquarters on our boat. Next time, make sure you chip off the parts that were about to hit first, Briggs yelled in a talkie. There was, there was a small earthquake in Peru because of Logan's failure, and Logan got incredibly defensive, which I couldn't blame him for. I did the best I could. You don't even know, man. You don't have any idea how hard it was for me down there. I think I do. I've been doing this for 30, 20 years, Briggs continued, using an excuse he did many times during those arguments between them, the younger members of the crew. It was cool to think about how many legendary responders Briggs worked with on the team. They'd stopped some of the most legendary storms that ever faced the planet. There were unsuccessful hurricanes that they were unable to stop, like Hurricane Noel, Ir Erica Iris and Hortensi, practically all of the hurricanes that the general's populace knew about were failures on the part of the response team. The point of our response team was to stop these horrible natural disasters before they even reached the coast. One might ask how we stop hurricanes, and I will tell you it is not how you expect. While it must not, it might not seem this way from what I told you about our team, we are largely spiritual. By this I mean we attribute a lot of the storms and disasters to the weather gods that live high in the clouds. They are mighty gods up there, like the mother Contessa who births all the major hurricanes on the west part of the world. Her sons and daughters ravage the world with their mighty powers, decimating countries of various sizes. But then there's Spiral, the father of the world's tornadoes. If anything, he's more of a masochist if I ever saw one. For example, he finds pleasure in life by throwing some of the world the worst storms the world has ever seen towards continents with no remorse. There were many other gods that I had had difficult had I'd have to deal with during my time with the rest of the responders. These gods were difficult to deal with because we are the only humans they'd ever talked to. We're really the only people who knew about them for a number of reasons. First, any knowledge of the disaster gods was taken out of schools, universities, and libraries, and databases of all kinds. It was important for the general populace not to know about the weather gods, so they didn't purposely try to upset them. This way, the Earth could avoid getting hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, and floods pelted at it whenever a teenager tried to bother a weather god with a Ouija board. Meteorologists and weather scientists think that the weather can be predicted by technology, but this isn't true. If, for example, Contessa was upset with one of her children, she would send them out into the world and punish as punishment, and they would ravage some coastline on a Sunday. They would often do this without regard for human life, and the same could be said for the gods of tornadoes and wildfires and floods. But as responders, we're, we are trained to de-escalate the anger of the gods. If Contessa was about to punish one of her children by sending them out of the house in the clouds, one of us would go up to the highest mountain and attempt to convince her against it. There were some times when we could do this and other times when we would have to take evasive action. The four of us returned to the responders base in San Diego within a couple of days. The second I got there, I made sure to give my boat the juggernaut to a group of repairmen. 
While I was boating back, I couldn't help but think about how much damage the boat had received from the choppy, heavy waves. Besides, if my boat broke, I would have to pay for half of the other one with my own money, and responders weren't very wealthy. My yearly earnings was barely in the six digits, which didn't allow for much wiggle room as a world traveler, and it was especially low for someone who broke almost all their vehicles or equipment on the job in some aspect. You did a good job, Howard told us when we arrived, but there's even more pressing matters to attend to now. All of you, come with me. I thought I would be able to wind down after the entire week of travel. The kind of relaxation was much needed, especially because you're sitting and standing in the same positions when you're boating all day. He took the four of us through the training room where there were potential responders performing difficult tasks and several large tanks on either side of us they usually included swimming this usually included swimming in a pool with heavy equipment like drills and oxygen tanks strapped to your back if you didn't like water you ne never made it as a responder but then howard took us in to what we'd like to call the weather room this was a large metal room in, in our underground headquarters that had television screens and computer monitors stacked up on each other almost like a war room there were several people manning computers in the room trying to determine the heart rate of all the weather gods. This would help them know when a weather god was angry or sad, allowing them to determine if they might send a mighty storm or natural disaster towards Earth to entertain themselves. And on the televisions, there were these images of different countries with meteorological readouts that you could see a weatherman stand in front of during a morning show. America was doing just fine on that late August day with lots of sun all throughout. Canada had a few showers here and there, maybe some thunderstorms, but nothing we needed to respond to. There was nothing particularly unnatural about the weather above Asia or Africa or even Europe. It was painfully normal at first glance, which was a rarity as a first res as a responder. Something's big, something big's about to happen all across the world. You can see the clouds converging over it in very unnatural ways over specific areas, which means one of the gods is feeling very angry. Logan looked at Howard. Well, which one is it? And Howard began to respond with an exaggerated sigh. This wasn't a good sign, usually. Then he began, it's the king of the volcanoes, Kazan, who has just lost one of his children in birth. The little flame extinguished within days before it was delivered from his partner's womb. And so he cries and sobs, and the volcanoes all over the earth are beginning to liven again. There are some volcanoes that have become active after being inactive for many years. In a matter of hours, it's likely one of them will start erupting. Howard showed the rest of the team the screen that was plastered with red and black warning signs over the documented volcanoes in the world. Then he said, A time ago, I put sensors in the mouths of each of the world's volcanoes so I could detect when they were going to erupt. Over the night, they started growing and growing. Then we had Roger over there tracing Kazan's heart rate, and it was growing exponentially. Then his wife was two, and we tapped into their conversation to get more details. Everyone knew Howard had eyes on each of the gods. It was the whole reason he hired a dedicated team to measure their heart rate, health, and to listen to what they were saying. Getting microphones on each of the gods wasn't easy. When he started the natural disaster response team, he put it up to himself to sneak into the gods' homes when they were sleeping and place trackers on them. Oftentimes, he was unsuccessful. Other times, the gods found his technology and sent horrendous storms down to earth in anger. But after many attempts, Howard was able to get his spying gear and technology to the homes of the weather gods. So we need to talk to Kazan and stop him from letting these volcanoes through? Then I'll do the talking, both me and a, a more established member of the group, Briggs said, trying to organize the situation himself. Howard was a great leader, but Briggs was much better at executing missions than Howard ever was. It was one of the reasons why he was on the response team as long as he'd been. Of course, Howard remarked, but it's going to, take a, going to be a lot tougher than that. See, the volcanoes are shooting up rapidly. We'll have to send one group of you to deal with Kazan and the other to cover all over all of the known active and inactive volcanoes in the world. Logan commented, but that could take days, boss, maybe even weeks. How much longer do we have? Not long, and certainly not that long. The volcano sensors say the volcanoes might burst in the next couple of hours. As I said before, he typed something on the middle console in the room. I've been composing a list of volcanoes that need our attention. You will be putting a metallic covering over them that cools the inside of volcanoes significantly. But more importantly, the magma will have to, a difficult time trying to penetrate the metal sheets. Then we will need to find a way to get the magma to go back down to the ground. As per usual, we'll probably end up drilling a hole 
for each volcano to reach the Earth's core. As I know, you're concerned about numbers, so I'm adding another member to the response team for this particular outing, he continued. Then Howard went back to the training room and called out for a young woman named Sherry. When he had the rest of the team shake her hand, he said, Sherry is one of the brightest I have. Completing this mission with you will, and covering the volcanoes will be her next progression. And if she succeeds, she will be promoted with the likes of all of you. I have confidence you will get along. Howard spit, uh, split us up just as Briggs suggested. The two of us went to the machine, which we called the elevator, that brought us to the plane where the weather gods existed. And all the members, including myself, knew taking out the volcanoes would be a long and arduous process. Even worse, it, if it would stop us from being able to respond to potentially threatening natural disasters all over the world. But we had no choice. The threat was too real, and it seemed like we couldn't respond quick enough. The elevator took us up through the atmosphere and past the clouds to meet the weather gods. It seemed to me that the people of San Diego thought we were checking on weather high above, but they didn't know we were actually entering the houses of gods. Many Californians looked at us like we were fools. Many of them didn't understand the kinds of work we were doing because potentially natural disasters never hit the news. In very rare occasions, maybe, but mostly, we would be responding to them before anyone heard of them. Of course, there was evidence of our work, and Howard won the Nobel Peace Prize for stopping 12 potential hurricanes and 20 tornadoes in one year, but nobody really knew what that meant. Anyway, Briggs and I made a short conversation as we used the elevator. Yes, he was the man that taught me the most about being a responder, but I never said we were great friends. I honestly didn't think he was friends with anybody except for himself. I can't believe Howard keeps those kids, he would say. They don't listen to orders and they're horrendous at responding to these disasters. Just because Logan has a Navy SEAL doesn't mean he has any skill at stopping earthquakes. I don't know why he's thinking, put what he's thinking, putting that Lindsay girl around us either. While he was saying all that, I nodded my head. I often thought that the main reason Briggs wouldn't leave the force was because he didn't have anywhere else to go. I suppose he could go be a meteorologist just like the rest of the responders who got too old to do these dangerous tax, tax, tasks do, but it's likely he wouldn't want that. Perhaps he could convince Howard to get him to work with the responders in some capacity because he needed it desperately. Then he got to the top of the clouds. We opened the door of the elevator and stepped out. Contrary to popular belief, clouds are very sustainable and easy to walk on. At first, I was weary of it, but after talking to gods for several years, it didn't bother me. Now, as we walked through the cloud pathway, we reached a group of doors that were lined up next to each other. Each represented the door for a house of a weather god. There was one that was seaweed, barnacles, and sponges that were residing on it. This belonged to Contessa, the one who caused the hurricanes. Then there was the door that opened to the earthquake makers, the, the family of Quakers, and their door was made of hardened rock. There were other doors for the other gods responsible for the world's natural disasters, but Kazan sat in the middle. It was made of black and black dust and molten rock, and there was lava coming out from under it. The two of us were careful not to hurt ourselves when we opened the door. Briggs practically kicked it open and jumped over the magma pile to get inside, and when we arrived, there was a long stairway that worked its way up towards Kazan's real home. And after we finally stepped along the steps, we could hear Kazan screaming in agony. Howard gave, him, gave them more detail about Kazan's partner's stillborn. He was able to he was to be a son, and the only proper heir to Kazan's throne. None of his daughters could boil up volcanoes well enough to get them to erupt, so Kazan had been trying for hundreds of years to find his own successor. He would make partner with a weather sprite and sleep with them so he, they could bear a child for him. And during each instance, it didn't work. The most recent time, they'd never gotten as close as they had with a boy. Briggs made it to yet another door at Kazan's abode and knocked. Kazan, we've been we've bearing we're bearing some gifts. We'd like to discuss with you how you how great you are. Briggs would attempt to use this tactic where he tried to drown the weather god with comp compliments. This gave him a lot of leverage. In some situations, there were times when some of the weather gods even liked him. He always used to tell me that being a responder is like being a psychiatrist. He would calm down the patients and tell them how they were. This always seemed to help, but the voice of the volcano master screamed back down at them. There's no compliments that will help me get over my sadness. You couldn't possibly understand what this means to me. You couldn't know how difficult it is to lose a child you've been waiting centuries to make. 
And we want to offer our condolences, Kazan. It breaks our hearts to see you lose someone so significant. You know that I've always been here for you. I've always thought of you as a great friend and ally, and I want to extend the same help to you now. Briggs started. Then what, what could you possibly do to help me? Could you bring back my child? Could you save the body of the dead sprite who attempted to bring hot magma out from her womb? I can offer you friendship, Bragma, Briggs revealed. I can bring you something I know you haven't had for a long time. A companion. Someone you can trust. The Volcano Master spit steam from his nose and hot magma from his tonsils. I want the child back. That's the only thing I want. And the two knew that there would be volcanoes bubbling and becoming active again with his anger. They knew that there had to be something significant happening. And this wasn't a wrong assumption. Both Lindsay, Logan, and Sherry were already using their response helicopters to fly to different volcanoes all across the world and putting covers on them. Thankfully, they'd covered up the more active volcanoes that were about to burst before they went, just as Howard suggested. Now, the way they would put covers on the volcanoes could be difficult. First, one of them would spray a thick expanding sponge that would fit the form of the open volcano. Then they would hammer and screw a metal plate over the top of the hole. Now, if this would be a full metal plate, then it would be very difficult to carry all the way to the top of these mountains. But the scientists who worked for Howard had created a rollable metal that could be rolled over the top of the volcanoes. They were in rolls because they were portable and could be taken place to place. And while all of this was happening, Briggs was running out of options. I'd, I didn't really know what to do, but I suggested to him, why don't we use a dart? And I was, I was speaking to him about the, dark, the dart that puts the weather gods to sleep. It would effectively shut them off and stop whatever storm they were brewing. And although Briggs was opposed to it at first, because morally he felt it was wrong, there was ne really no option left. There was no way that they could recover the child because it was already dead. After I gave t him time to consider the idea, he did agree. Throw a dart into his neck when he's not looking, Briggs said to me, and we'll deal with his anger once the rest of the volcanoes are covered up. So I did what he told me. I took, his, I took one of the darts out from the small pouch of my extreme weather suit and climbed into Kazan's home. I, may, I was able to throw myself through one of the windows and, and look at the weather god myself. Then I threw the dart into his neck as accurately as I could. I'm glad the thing hit its side when it did, because honestly, I didn't know what I would do if it didn't. When the beast fell, felt the pinch, he used his arm to reach around his neck to touch it. At that point, wh when he finally noticed the dart, he was helpless to do anything about it. The volcano master fell to the ground in his body, which was eight feet tall and a couple hundred pounds in weight. He was slender, so it didn't take long for the dart to completely knock him out. Just as Briggs and I presumed, the volcanoes did stop erupting as quickly as they were they were. Now, that didn't mean they still weren't going to erupt. That was inevitable because Kazan had gotten so angry and sad at the same time. Then Briggs, then Briggs would say, stay with Kazan so we could calm him down when he woke up. There was no telling what he would do when he did wake up, and the two of us were sort of desperate to figure out what to do next. There's one weather god that has more children than she could ever keep track of. She might let Kazan adopt one of them, Briggs mentioned to me. Contessa, I told him, knowing the answer further in advance. She's the one. And he nodded his head to confirm it. I knew it would be difficult, but Contessa wasn't the hardest weather god to deal with. She had quirks about her, but wouldn't be as hard, hard as Kazan was. So I headed out of Kazan's home and down the stairs towards the door that led to the others. I, I moved relatively quickly as I didn't want Kazan to wake up knowing that we put him to sleep. When I opened the door of Con of Contessa's home, the queen of the hurricane, I saw a magnificent palace that was kept in much better condition than Kazan's home. Contessa had workers making the home look presentable, although I knew she wouldn't have any guests. Many of the weather gods, or almost all of them, hated each other greatly. Either way, once I got to the front door of her mansion, I knocked on the door and said, I am the natural disaster. I am from the natural disaster response team. I am in great need of your help. And there was no answer for a long time, long while until a figure with a cloud-like composition opened the door. From what I gathered, he would have to be one of her butlers. My master isn't home right now. She's off planning her next hurricane, I presume. Or, you know, I think she might be on, on vacation, he said. With that, he closed the door, and I surely thought Briggs would be dead by the time I returned to him. 
but I heard the voices of the babies of Contessa crying at the top of the mansion, and I climbed on the side of it. As I pushed through one of the doors, I found them all spread out in this large room. There had to be about a hundred little storm clouds, little baby hurricanes that were bred to wreak havoc over the world in that room. In one way, it was endearing to see what they were as infants, sort of like a baby hippopotamus. But when I reminded myself of how hazardous and horrible these infants would grow to be, I was afraid. Regardless, I grabbed one of them and tucked them into my backpack I carried. Then I hightailed my way to Contessa's, out of Contessa's home and ran through Kazan's door once again. Thankfully, Briggs was sitting there with the body of the volcano master. There was a part of Briggs, I think, that liked responding to volcanoes more than any other kind of natural disaster. He was looking at Kazan's collection of volcanoes out in the distance when I, when I said, I got the baby for him, and I held it up to him, and he was satisfied. Sure, he had no idea how I accomplished such a feat or how Contessa would respond if she did find out that one of her babies had been stolen, but we could deal with that later. As I mentioned before, Contessa was one rational weather god. When Kazan woke up, he was happy that he had a child to take care of. He was taken by the clouds, ch cloud child's features and kept him, even though he was not the son he truly wanted. We returned to the responders' headquarters shortly after, and to our surprise, Logan, Lindsay, and Howard were all there. They said the new recruit did a su superb job keeping her cool during those tense moments when they covered the volcano. Of course, over the next couple of weeks, we had to take off the coverings themselves. Keeping them on could anger Kazan once he had wasn't preoccupied with his child. So when one of the stranger, so that went one of the stranger tales from the natural disaster response team. Contessa never did respond. That remember the baby that was stolen from her, which was sad in our in one way. Our relationship with Kazan was much better, as he was considered one of the wild card gods that no one could quite put their finger on. And although my years with the team would go much longer, I couldn't help but recall the strange story whether whenever I talked to new recruits. It was a great example of an improvisation, courage, and truly one of the more defining moments on the team. And so that is the story um, of the weather gods and this team, natural disaster team. I always thought, I really thought it would be cool to see like a group trying to stop a, a tornado, or, or not a tornado, but an earthquake. And that's kind of where the first scene came from. And, you know, kind of stopping like the tectonic plates from getting to each other and like having an organized group that kind of just, um, you know, figured that kind of stuff out. I thought it would be super cool to see that happen. Um, and that's kind of where the genesis of the story came from. Uh, I don't know why I just kind of thought about that, uh, but that image came to me and I was just like, wow, that's super, super cool. The idea of having these people who respond to the weather, the weather gods aspect I don't know where that also came from other than just the idea that it's I find it I've always found it funny that hurricanes are kind of like the only storm that are named after something like no tornado is named after something or no earthquake has a name either it's just kind of like oh it's this kind of earthquake or it's this kind of this but hurricanes for some reason they have some special privilege or something to be named after have actually quite beautiful names so I thought well um I don't know. I, it kind of felt like maybe there should be a sentience there because these names are so beautiful, um, but they're so horrendous, the, 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 the disasters that hurricanes cause. So I, that's kind of another thing where the story came from, and maybe that's always been building in my head. Um, but anyway, if you like the story, please let me know. Next week, we'll be going back to video camera and um, audio. Uh, but this week, we just could not make it happen. It happens sometimes. But uh, yeah, next week, also, we will be um, reading... A story called, well, I'm not quite sure what it's called, but it's about uh, animals, pets, that basically are, they make their um, owners younger. Um, and they have this strange power that's kind of like, so I would say it's kind of like a mix of Pokemon or Digimon, and then maybe like Back to the Future, I don't know, some kind of, it's like a weird time travel element, but with kind of like a Pokemon element too because these are resources they're special pets that people want to find and i think the inspiration for that story was really just living in new york city and seeing all these different pets that people have and treasure and um you know especially kind of diverse dogs and cats and awesome animals that you know you don't see normally they're not just like labradors or something or labs or um, you know just a golden retriever that you'd see normally they're actually a very diverse 
animals. And so I just found, I, I think maybe that's where some of the inspiration for that came from. Um, but anyway, uh, so this has been the Farfetch Podcast episode 44, I believe, maybe 43, I'm not sure. But um, I hope you did enjoy it. Uh, my name is Ryan Hawk, and I, um, yeah, I, I hope you really uh, had a fun time with this one. Um, other news, um, I can't think of anything, but do follow me on Ryan underscore Hawk. Or no, Ryan Hawk underscore 98 on Instagram. There you will find my link tree, which also has the new unspeakable text story, Invisible Soldier. If you remember a couple weeks back, I read a story called Invisible Soldier. Now that story has been turned into a comic book that is uh, brilliantly illustrated by Leo Sabala um, and written by myself and lettered by myself. So if you're interested in that, go check out my Instagram, go check out my unspeakable text website where you'll find all of these, this series of comic books that I've written myself. So anyway, thank you so much for listening and have a great day.